acquisition cases are by their very nature difficult to do. However, for most of our clients, we teach quite a robust approach to handle strategy cases. And since acquisition cases are indeed a subset of strategy cases, we assume most of the time that our clients can make that jump from a pure strategy case into an acquisition case. But we have seen that many candidates seem to be struggling with acquisition cases. So what we've decided to do, rather than make that assumption that candidates can make that small leaps of logic, we're going to put together an acquisition video, which is what you're going to see now, to see how we explicitly take a strategy case and convert it for an acquisition case. The Goldman Sachs and Company case in terms of buying a gold mine in Mongolia is one of the earliest cases we used to teach candidates. And then we kind of moved it into the background because we felt that this was too easy of a case to be teaching. But however, given the way candidates have been performing in cases, I think we've made maybe an error in terms of making that assumption. And we've decided to put together this acquisition video because we think it's one of the more major case techniques that need to be covered. And I think it makes sense, especially if you're interviewing with Bain and Company, given their private equity heritage, there has to be a very robust way to tackle these acquisition cases. So the case we're going to tackle today is, as I mentioned, one of the older cases that we follow. And if you want, you can just listen to the beginning of the case and try to solve it yourself and then watch the videos as we go through it. Or you can go through the videos with us as we solve this case. The case is a McKinsey case, medium level difficulty, I would say. I would expect a candidate to solve this case in 20, 25 minutes. 50 minutes on the bottom end, 20 average, and then max top end or maximum end would be about 25 minutes. And um, the parts in black are the parts that I would give someone in an interview. I am a kind of interviewer who doesn't release all of the information. I want to test someone's analytical skills and communication skills, and I want them to ask me for information. So I can see whether they understand the case and are asking me for the right information. If they're asking me for vaguely broad information, then I understand they don't understand the case. And I'm obviously unlikely to give them information. Now, McKinsey probably tackles this differently. They are probably going to give you a lot of data up front. Same with Bain. Bain will probably throw in a few graphs as well. And they'll expect you to, to discard and solve the case. And you can see here I've made the case question quite explicit. But even so, I would show you how to be able to adjust the case and make the question even more explicit. So let's read the case. Goldman Sachs' principal investment division is considering buying a mine in Mongolia. Mongolia being a country in Central Asia, I think bordering um, China on one side, and I think completely bordering the former Soviet Union, or at least the Russian part of the former Soviet Union on the other side. The mine is fully operational and producing 120,000 ounces per annum. Ounces would be the unit in which gold is measured. The Mongolian government is selling the mine in an attempt to raise much needed foreign country and pay down dollar denominated debt incurred after the collapse of the Soviet Union ended Mongolia's access to cheap gas. Even though the case doesn't say it, you kind of get the feeling this case was set somewhere in the mid 1990s or just you know, at the turn of the 1990s. The purchase price is $200 million, while the operating costs are $800 per ounce and the fixed costs are $25 million per annum. Goldman has an option of expanding the mine to produce an additional 20,000 ounces per annum. The purchase price on the option to expand is $20 million. If the expansion were to proceed, the total development time would be six months, whereupon the mine would immediately be operating at this new capacity. With the new capacity, total fixed costs increase by 10% and total variable costs by 15%. Assume the price of gold will be, will be $1,800 per ounce and assume that the client Goldman Sachs wants you, an independent party, to provide a go or no-go decision. The first thing we teach our candidates, obviously, is to understand all of the information you have been provided. It really pains me when I see someone simply jump into a case thinking that they've seen something similar, it looks similar to a case they've done before. No matter how similar a case may look to something you've already seen, it does not hurt you to take the time to prepare well. And in fact, I can tell you right now, when I teach our own clients, I immediately 
know the person's going to do badly when they jump into a case because if they're going to take shortcuts, if they're going to not take the time to prepare well, then clearly if that is their modus operandi, they're going to apply the same reckless way of solving cases throughout the case. And even if they may get away with it at the beginning of the case, they certainly won't get away with it later. So the approach we teach you exists for a reason and you should use it. So the words that stand out for me are the things that I may need clarity on or are important is the word considering. It's very clear that they haven't made the decision and that's confirmed with the go, no go decision at the end. In fact, what you're doing now is you're going through the case and seeing all the things that you may want to get clarity on from the interviewer, right? The mine is fully operational. That means it's fully producing at maximum capacity an option. Do they mean financial option? Probably. The mine would immediately be operating at new capacity after the expansion. So we assume that all of the new amounts of gold that can be produced after the, the expansion would come out after six months. And then there's some increases in costs, right? Now, when you've taken this time, when you've got the case and you've asked the interviewer for some time to analyze the case, write on the things that are not clear to you. Because the next step, obviously, is asking the interviewer clarifying questions to arrive at a key question, even in a McKinsey case, and this is a McKinsey case, I can show you how to come up with an even better question. So in a McKinsey case, you've got to think very carefully whether the question is explicit or whether you can make it better. Usually it's explicit, but sometimes McKinsey creates opportunities to make it better, right? So the first thing I would do is I would ask the interviewer, would you like to see my clarifying questions which would help me structure my approach, or would you like to see my approach first, knowing full well that when I do ask the clarifying questions, it may slightly change my approach. I always tell candidates to ask any interviewer this question, McKinsey, BCG, Bain, because you don't know what they're looking for. And if they let you get away with clarifying questions, it's obviously going to help you. I've come up with four clarifying questions. You know, Why are they considering this? What is their numerical metric? Is Mongolia the only option? Because it's a commodity, right? You can get gold mines anywhere in the world, so why go after Mongolia, which is kind of in the middle of nowhere? Huge mineral wealth, but that doesn't change the fact it's in the middle of nowhere with a very rickety legal system. Assuming go, no go means a decision has not been made yet. And then the final part is that because the costs are going to change after the option, I do want to know if those costs would increase gradually or should we make the assumption they come online immediately when new production comes online. For example, before production comes online for the expansion, the cost could start rising and reach their peak when production comes online. So I need to cater for that. So let's assume that we've got a friendly interviewer. He's had breakfast. He wants to talk to you. And he tells us, well, you can ask the questions you want. And he answers all the questions very simply, telling us that we're looking for a three-year ROI of 25%. Mongolia is the only option. We are not to consider anything else. Um, this is a no-go, no-go decision. The decision hasn't been made yet. And we can assume that uh, the costs are only incurred once the new capacity is online. So I will obviously thank him for that and ask him for just a few seconds to gather my thoughts. And I'll tell him at the end of this, I'm going to present my key question, my framework, and if necessary, my hypotheses. So now you can look what I've done here. Despite all the information presented, I've come up with a much more focused, deliberate key question, which is, will buying the gold mine generate a 25% three-year ROI for Goldman Sachs, right? And now my job, before I continue, is to present my tally sheet, which is very important, especially when you're dealing with large, messy cases, and then my structure. Now, when presenting your structure, and it's going to, and assuming it's going to be a large structure, never just go out and present your structure, because the interviewer is going to come back to you and tell you, you know what, let's assume your name is Hector, you know what, Hector, that's such a broad framework, it actually doesn't help me at all pinpoint the problem. So when you're about to present a large structure, understand that even though you may present a large structure, you certainly have to go in and zoom in on those areas that you need to focus on. Because if you're just going to analyze all parts of a large structure, you are really going to be there until the end of the year and maybe longer. So what I would do is, because this is going to be a large structure, I would tell the interviewer, okay, I'm going to present a structure for completeness only. You will see that it's fairly large, it has six parts, but I completely understand that given the information you've presented to me, I can eliminate some parts for analysis and I can quickly zoom in on the two or three most important areas that drive this decision. So the first thing I would do is I'd present my structure. I'd say, does this fit GS's strategy? Is the market an asset attractive? Second part of my structure. Thirdly, does Goldman Sachs have the ability to run the mine? Because obviously that depends whether they'll get the right price when they sell it. 
fourth is is the best is this the best acquisition option so opportunity cost if yes to all of the above how do we execute this is it going to be greenfields uh, jv it's going to be you know a acquisition we know it's an acquisition but within an acquisition how is the acquisition going to take place is it going to be taking over the operating assets only taking over the management of the business or just operating assets just management there are different combinations even within acquisitions and then finally what are the exit options for those of you who have seen our strategy approach you would know this is known as the should could would how approach would strategy obviously preempting that and for Bain we've put in what are your exit options I can tell you right now that Bain will be the only firm who would be salivating over the fact that you've discussed exit options so when you do present this to Bain have a tissue in your pocket that you can give to the Bain interviewer when they get all excited about this but I can assure you BCG and McKinsey may think that the structure is too complicated which is why we ask you to summarize it up front and tell the interviewer that you are going to prioritize it. Now, don't say things like should, could, would, because it sounds too clever. And you really, if you just memorize should, could, would, and when you use it even with me, I can very quickly see you don't understand what you are doing. So don't memorize should, could, would. I don't care how people name their structures as long as they understand why they're doing it. Memorization of structures leads to automatic failure. Because if you're memorizing a structure, I'm not happy. Sure, interviewers tell you you need a good structure, but they also want to know why you're using the structure. So let's erase that and let's explain how I will introduce this. I will tell the interviewer very quickly. I will assume there's alignment, so I'm not going to analyze this. I think there's three important parts in market attractiveness. One is the attractiveness of the market. Second is the attractiveness of the asset. And third, whether we can hit our numerical target, which in this case is an ROI target. And for those of you who have looked at our market entry strategy approach, you notice it's almost exactly the same, except here, under market attractiveness, we have three parts, but under an acquisition case, we own, under a market entry case, we only have two parts. The new part here is attractiveness of the asset, because here we are acquiring an asset, and we need to do proper due diligence. We'll assume no further analysis is required on buying the mine. We'll, we'll assume that we're going to ignore this, because earlier the interviewer said only look at Mongolia. We'll assume that just some contractual details that are outside of the case, but it does seem important to me. If you want me to analyze it, I will. And exit options for me are important because the exit options drive the sales price, which drives the ROI. And given the fact that we plan to sell in three years, anything could happen. So I think we've got to analyze this. Now that you've presented your framework, you can very quickly see three or four things are not requiring further analysis. So you can eliminate them. The reason I left out execution because I'm not really sure that the interviewer wants me to analyze it later. So I left it out knowing full well that because I haven't eliminated it, I may have to eliminate it later, which leaves two areas for analysis. Now, the key thing here is that when you have two areas for analysis, you don't just start at the top and work your way down, right? You've got to apply the 80-20 rule and determine which branch is the most important and start at that branch. Well, logically speaking, a board is never going to go ahead and um, look at... Um, you know, exit options until they've decided to, to acquire a market or enter a market or acquire a company. And to know if you want to acquire a company or enter a market, you have to look at whether it's attractive, whether the asset is attractive, and can the financial metrics be achieved. Now, if you've been through brainstorming with us, you would know we teach you a certain way to answer these questions. Brainstorm why a market would be attractive for gold to a company. Well, Supply trends dictate gold prices. Less supply, higher price. Gold is an inflation hedge. The higher the inflation, the higher the price. Gold prices is generally inversely proportional to dollar prices because dollar prices tend to be directly proportional to inflation. So if you were well read, you would know this. And most people would ask me, Michael, how do I know these things? I mean, how do I figure these things out? Well, business judgment, a.k.a. general knowledge, a.k.a. good guessing, is a result of things you have done before the time you interview for cases. Let me rephrase that. If you've got poor business judgment, it's very hard to improve it just before a case interview. So if you've got two months to prepare, you probably can do it. A month to prepare, possible. And what I'd recommend you do is you read the Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, religiously every day. Don't read it as, as work. Read it recreationally because when you read things recreationally you remember more and don't just read the business section read the fashion read the sports section read the travel tourism hotel section general knowledge is just that general you don't know what you will need so you need to be well read is the asset attractive well a couple of things determine the attractiveness of the asset now what is the Mongolian legislation 
around mining and what is the political landscape? Is that likely to change as political parties change? What are the environmental issues, environmental liabilities? What are the labor unions like? And are they going to drive up the price of um, labor, which is one of the largest costs? Are they going to go on massive strikes? Are they easy to work with? What are the technological requirements? Can we mine in Mongolia? You know, is it deep level mine? Is it open pit mining? Do they use a certain kind of sludge or slurry technique? What are the other liabilities that we are not aware of? When you're buying an asset, you are inheriting liabilities, you know? You break it, you own it. In this case, you buy it, you own it, right? What are the permitting requirements? Sometimes you have to do certain things like allow locals to own a certain part of the facilities or become preferred suppliers for your permits to be renewed. There's no point sinking a couple of billion dollars worth of money into the asset, but knowing full well that you may not get it back if you miss any of the permitting requirements. Common problem in most developing economies where the government is trying to make sure that the locals are not excluded from the development story, the Cinderella story of development. What is the life of the mine? How old is this mine? Are we buying it at the beginning of the life or at the end of the life? If it's the end of the life, how much reserves does it have? Does the reserves justify the sales price? Selling the mine in three years, what's going to happen in three years? Is there any legislation that's going to come up that's going to change things? What's the market going to look like? Repatriation of funds, can we remove our dollars once we generate them? Financial metrics should be easy. It's ROI, right? We've already been told that. ROI is the gain of the investment minus the cost of the investment all over the cost of the investment. And we can assume here yeah, that we, the way we're going to calculate the valuation price is we're going to say, well, the earnings multiplied by the P ratio of comparable companies will give us the valuation. So we have the selling price, right? Now, why are we interested in selling price? Well, think about it. What are the gains you get? The gains that the company would get from this acquisition would be the gains of the profits from running the facility every year for three years. And the other gain would be the sales price it generates. And obviously, the cost would be the purchase price. So that's why we need to work out the selling price, because it is one of the gains. So assume the interviewer would give you the P ratio. Some interviewers may ask you to calculate that. Unlikely, but if they do ask you to calculate that, just compare it to other mining companies or the similar size companies in similar markets. You don't have to be exactly accurate. P ratios are anywhere from 7 to 15. You've got to pick something that makes sense. And then these are all business judgment issues, which I mentioned comes from being well read. There's no other way. You just have sharp analysis. You're well read or you're well traveled. That's the only way to have strong business judgment. And of course, if you're well-read, well-traveled, and you're analytical, then by God, you're going to be extraordinary at business judgment. So let's continue with this case, right? Let's assume that you've asked the interviewer all the information on market attractiveness and the asset attractiveness, and they're happy with that. So the one thing we need to further analyze, obviously, is the options available to the client. The client has two options here. The one is Goldman Sachs can buy the mine and not develop it further, or... Goldman Sachs can buy the mine with the option to develop it further and develop it further. So we actually have two options, right? And we have to calculate the ROI for both options, which means per an option, we have to calculate the profits, costs, revenues. So let's look at the profits, costs, revenues for year one, two, three. That's how long Goldman Sachs is going to own the mine. But with the status quo, assuming we don't develop the mine further. Well, this is quite easy to do, right? Think about it. You've got revenue. You know the amount of ounces they're producing per year. You know the price per ounce. You work that out and you multiply it by three to get the revenue for three years. You do the exact same calculation for variable costs. Fixed costs, a little bit different. When I was given the fixed costs earlier, I deliberately made it a bit vague. When I said fixed costs, I'm, I didn't say whether it's fixed costs or capital investments directly. If it was capital investments, you would have to determine how you're going to treat that capital investment on your income statement balance sheet, how are you going to depreciate it? If it was the depreciated capital exp uh, capital cost, then you just say 25 million each year, right? But let's assume that that cost of 25 million is not the depreciated cost. It is the capital cost. So you've got to depreciate it first. You divide it by the life of the asset, 20 years, and you multiply it by three years to get the cost you would incur over three years. So now I find this very common when I interview candidates from uh, Dubai, France, and so on. Because of language and terminology, they sometimes get confused between depreciated cost and fixed cost or capital cost. So always confirm that with the interviewer. You've got to confirm, is the fixed cost after depreciation, so you've got to carry the full $25 million per year, 
or is the $25 million the capital cost that you still have to depreciate? In which case, you know you need to know the life of the asset and determine the depreciation technique you're going to use. You know, there's many different techniques. Obviously, you need to pay for the option. You may end up doing nothing with it, but you're going to buy the option. And then if you add up all these things, you get the profit. All right. So now let's look at option two which is whereby in the year one, it's exactly the same as before, but then in year two and three, you have new assets coming online. So let's do that calculation, right? So profit year one with expansion, it's going to look exactly as year one before. You take the revenue per ounce, multiplied by the number of ounces, variable costs stay the same, fixed costs, rather than multiplying it by three, there's only one year here. So you take $25 million divided by the life of the asset times one year, giving you $1.25 million, the option price, and then the profits. Now we've got to do the same calculation for years two and three, knowing that revenue would change because you're producing more gold, variable costs increase, fixed costs increase, but you're also depreciating it over 20 years, right? And you're carrying it for two years. So let's look at that. Simple calculations, right? Nothing complicated. Yet. Let's go through each one. You've no very revenue has changed because you're producing more gold. Variable costs have gone up. Fixed costs have gone up. You depreciate over 20 years, and then you have to work out the price for two years. That's why you multiply for two. Profit has gone up a little bit, giving us a different total profit. So now what do we do? We've got the profit, we've got the costs. We pretty much have everything to work out the ROI for the option of not increasing production and for the option of increasing production. So let's plug in the numbers, right? ROI with the status quo, assuming we buy the option but we do nothing with it. The profit we get for selling this mine is, let's say, $328 million. I have not at all um, um, changed much here. I mean, assume that. I put in a P ratio here and simply multiply that to get a selling price, right? That we've received earlier. You've seen I've used a P ratio earlier. So I simply multiplied the profit by the P ratio to get the selling price, minus the purchase price all over the purchase price, giving me a ROI. Do the same thing with the expansion op option. Slightly higher pro profit, slightly higher selling price, because if I'm multiplying a higher profit by the same P ratio, I'm obviously going to get a higher selling price. Same purchase price divided by the same purchase price, and you can see that my ROI goes up slightly. So now I've got to wrap this up. And the way I'd wrap it up is that I would always go back and make sure that I've covered everything in my framework. I won't just jump in and say, you know what, I've got an answer, let's do everything. I'd always take time and say, before I give you my answer, which I have, I just want to step back a second and make sure I've covered everything in my framework. So hits the financial metrics easily. Is the market attractive? Yes. Assume that that data was presented. Is the asset attractive? Yes. Assume that data was presented to you by the interviewer to indicate the market and the asset is attractive. Update my tally sheet. And then the last thing I'll talk about is exit options. I'm going to look at what the gold price projection will be over the next three years, because while they've given me a projection, I'm not convinced that will be the case. I would look at current multiples for similar sales lowest multiples for similar sales because don't work with averages remember things can go wrong so you want to look at what is the worst case situation and whether you can live with it and finally substitute assets why in the world would we want to buy a gold mine in mongolia when we could probably got a better gold mine in canada there could be a number of reasons here but the reason i'm looking at this and i'd want to discuss it with the interviewer is to point out and remember if i'm going to raise something an interviewer says he doesn't want to discuss i'll have to get to the point very quickly to convince him that I'm not just ignoring the points. So I'd say something like, even though you mentioned we shouldn't look at other options, one of the questions in my mind is that gold is a commodity. It's the same in every single country. So it's not as if we're buying tangible assets here. So assuming we're paying a fair price, which it doesn't seem that way, it seems we're paying a very low price, why would we not look at buying a gold asset in another country where the risk-adjusted rate of return may be higher? right? Or we could even buy another asset that also was an inflation hedge like platinum. You gotta play with those things, but you got to get to the point quickly. If you beat around the bush and tell the interviewer like, you know, uh, what we could do is, um, one of the things I'm thinking about is that, uh, you know, gold is, is, is highly risky, Mongolia is highly risky, and what we could do is, we could maybe look around and we could see other things we could buy, because I think that it is possible that we're exposing ourselves to more risk, 
and I'm not really sure why we would do that. If you speak in that way, you sound like someone who's drunk and didn't have any coffee and just continued getting drunk the whole day. So people always say I communicate it clearly, but believe me, that's how most people sound when they do a case. So make sure you are to the point. So let's wrap up the case, right? The way I'd wrap up the case is I would do it a little bit different here. Yeah? I would say something like, well, I could provide my answer, but before I do that, I'm going to very briefly explain just a few considerations. The first one is I believe this asset is being sold too cheaply. And provided there are no unknown liabilities and we can retain and manage the operating team, I think this asset will vastly exceed our return target. I do have some concerns, however, and one of my concerns is that all of this assets are, all of the calculations are being done in a high inflationary environment with limited supply and a weak dollar. If there is limited supply now, I'm pretty sure that some other suppliers will bring capacity online. So within three years, we could have a glut in the market, which drives down the price of gold. Beyond that, inflation may change, and we may have a totally different macroeconomic environment. We're also dealing with an emerging market where law enforcement, repatriation of funds, and business requirements are neither clear at all. So I think that's a big risk which we're assuming away. But that said, you know, there's such a big difference between 1,200 and 25%. I think that even if these things didn't work out, we could potentially justify um, this investment. So I'd say they should go ahead, provided that all the information you gave me is correct, but I'm happy to do further analysis if required. And that would be a very, very eloquent, simple, but also very insightful way to do the case. A couple of observations about this case. Clearly, everything rests on the key question. You get the key question wrong, you are doomed because you end up solving the wrong case. Don't memorize frameworks. I know what 95% of people are going to do by watching this video. They'll memorize a framework and look for an acquisition case. And then they see an acquisition case, they'll put in this framework. But I can change one thing in the acquisition case to make the framework wrong. And that's why I don't want you to memorize the framework. That one thing is if I said, should Goldman Sachs buy this gold mine? If I said, should Goldman Sachs buy this gold mine? You only look at the should part of the framework, which is attractiveness of the market, attractiveness of the asset, and can they hit their return figure. And what happens with many candidates is they don't hear that, they don't hear the nuances in the key question. All they hear is acquisition question, they throw out the big framework, and then they don't know why they were failed. The interviewer tells him, well, I only wanted you to look at the attractiveness of the market. And they'll come back to me and say, you know what, Michael, the interviewer said this is an acquisition case, I use the framework, and it's wrong. Well, it's wrong because you didn't listen to the key question that they gave you. If they say, should we do it, they've narrowed down everything within the broad framework and only want you to look at the should part. Only if they didn't say something like, should Goldman Sachs buy this gold mine, can you use the broader framework? If they say, could Goldman Sachs buy the gold mine, also a different framework. If they said, would they buy it, different framework. So you don't memorize frameworks. You've got to think about what you are asked to solve. As you can see, language is very important. Preempting the interview and telling them, you know what? This is a broad case. I'm giving it to you for completeness only, but I'm very quickly going to isolate the areas for analysis. Simple communication techniques push the case forward. Well-communicated assumptions like saying, you know what, I don't think it's important for us to look at operating the asset, but if you want to, I'll look at it. You probably cut out about 20 minutes of analysis. Clearly, the only difference between this and a market entry case is the should branch, whereby in the market entry case, you have two areas in the should branch. In an acquisition case, you have three areas because you have to do due diligence on an asset. Whenever you have an equation as part of the key things you are chasing, like profitability, margins, ROI, believe me, the equation will, be, will drive everything because the equation tells you what data you need. I always tell people that when you write, you've got to write neatly. The way we've structured this video is that if I had to do it by hand, the way it's written in this, the way everything's laid out in this video is the way I'd have written it in a sheet of paper. So when I designed the video, I designed it in such a way that when you write things, it's got to look like the video. I didn't just use a you know, um, graphics to make it easier to present complex things. I use graphics so that I could show you a neater way that I would have written this out anyway. And if the graphics allowed me to do something that I couldn't have written in, then I wouldn't have done it because that's a misrepresentation of what I would have written. Beyond that, people make a lot of mistakes when it comes to estimation by understanding numbers units and so on. Don't make those mistakes. As always, this is a very elegant, very sophisticated, very simple framework. It has dazzled many an interviewer when it's been used. Use it well and you will do very well. Use it badly and you take the wrong advice out of this video, you will obviously struggle. As always, I am more than happy to listen to any 
questions or pieces of advice people have. And if you have a question, you can post it be below the video, and I'd be happy to respond to that.